forecast. So we are in a suboptimal environment, but with expectation and anticipation that we will go back to the environment that we are more familiar with. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our schools had the chance to be uh, prepared in that respect to have the procurement of PPE, face shields, face covers, uh, thermometers, hand sanitizers, and the like. And I just want to remind you uh, that the state itself, in anticipation of reopening our schools to in-person instruction, has provided already uh, millions and millions of masks and face shields, tens of thousands of thermometers, and million and a half gallons of hand sanitizer. I recognize that's not enough, and I'll talk in a moment of what we were successfully able to do with the budget to provide an unprecedented amount of resources to supplement what the state has already provided. But this is important uh, because I want folks to know the state's commitment to provide at no cost to the districts uh, these supplies in anticipation of being able to move in the direction all of us want to move. That said, we're anticipating, based upon the current analysis, uh, and we'll be coming out Monday with more detailed uh, information as it relates to county by county watch list, which is foundational. We'll talk more about that in a few moments as well. But we estimate at this moment at least over 90 percent of our students, and you can argue it's uh, closer to 95, 97 percent uh, of our students are likely to start the school year with distance learning. And that's what we're preparing for. That's what we're disproportionately focused on. Uh, that school year has already begun uh, for many. Yesterday, today, next week, large cohort a week after. Uh, so school year is upon us, and we are now just beginning this journey together uh, on a more robust approach to distance learning in this state. We made this point. Uh, that schools may be closed, and I've made this point in the past, but class is still in session, that we are committed, we are accountable to continuing to ensure that not only we're preparing our teachers to be great teachers in a very constrained and difficult environment, preparing our students to be at their best, uh, but that we are preparing uh, a broad strategy, recognize that we still have a lot of gaps and a lot of inequities that need to be addressed. And so we will get to some of the details of what we're planning to do in that space in a moment. But I want you to know uh, that is top of mind, and we're very cognizant of our responsibility in those challenges. Accordingly, we've been guided over the course of the last many months by a lot of outreach. Uh, I want to thank, and he'll be on phone in a moment, uh, our superintendent of public education, the work CDE, California Department of Education, has done in terms of their outreach, formal, informal uh, surveys that they've put out, surveys that the state has put out, other organizations, nonprofits, NGOs have put out, uh, really trying to get a sense of where school districts are, where parents are, uh, and where our workforce believes we need to go as it relates to supporting our efforts on distance learning. You'll just see three uh, specific surveys on this slide uh, that represent different times uh, and different questions uh, related uh, to our preparedness. You'll see that first uh, comment, or rather first stat, 96.1 percent of school districts that reported uh, they were at least starting to provide technology for students for distance learning. This was at the end. This specifically was a survey from May 15th to the end of the school year uh, where we were all rushing uh, to provide for distance learning. But you can see the vast majority, overwhelming majority of districts were moving in that direction. And we want to carry that momentum and all of the challenges related to the closing of that school year and spring session, the lessons learned. We want to carry some of that momentum uh, into the fall session. 91 percent of parents in another survey, this was done in late July, uh, say that they have the technology needed for distance learning. Now, I, I recognize you get under those numbers, uh, what does that mean? One, one laptop for four uh, members of the family, that's not adequate. Download speeds, that may not be top of class. All of those things are self-evident in terms of our concerns, but you get a sense of where parents at least felt they were as it relates to just basic technology needs for distance learning. But when you get to the issue of confidence, when you get to an issue of more nuance, you can see a smaller number of people, districts, uh, students, and families feel that they have 
ultimately uh, the kind of capacity, uh, understanding, ability uh, to utilize this technology in, in a meaningful and more robust manner. And so we talk in terms of bridging the digital divide. It's not just about Wi-Fi hotspots and not just about what you plug uh, those virtual hotspots into. It's also about something much richer, much deeper. Uh, that said, we put out uh, new requirements. Not every state did this. In fact, I would argue the vast majority, based upon our analysis of states, have not done this, but California did. We put out expectations, guide rails, with real money, and I'll get to the money in a moment, with our expectations for our statewide requirements as it relates to what distance learning would look like. The reason we were able to do that is we had enlightened leadership in the legislature that was committed to that cause. Obviously, the great support, the superintendent of public education and Linda Darling Hammond at the school board here you'll hear from in a moment as well. But we were able to have clarity in terms of our conviction uh, that we believe that distance learning was likely to happen based upon community spread of COVID-19 and the background rates. And so we had time to really be deliberative time to work with the legislature on protocols, processes, on budget language to really condition requirements with funding. So it's really about local flexibility at the end of the day, but with real accountability in terms of minimum requirements. Those include access to more devices for those that don't have them, more connectivity, quality connectivity, daily interaction. Look, as I said, digital or rather distance learning is suboptimal. We just don't want people to take their lectures and just videotape them and then provide them online. By the way, you can just go to YouTube and pretty much get that in every subject matter that's ever been debated uh, since the beginning of mankind. Uh, this has to be a much more interactive process where we want to bring our students into the screen truly engaged, peer to peer, not just with the interaction uh, of a teacher. And so we want a more dynamic engagement uh, to the extent possible uh, through distance learning. We want as much individualized learning, particularly for students of special needs, which is foundational as much as we can. And that's an area of obvious concern. And I'm going to talk about more of that in a moment. We want challenging assignments. We don't want just people to dial this in. And we want to recognize the diversity of the state, children, uh, as well as parents. Uh, that uh, are uh, not necessarily as proficient in English, so ESL learners, English second language learners, and obviously uh, meeting the needs of those with uh, special uh, challenges. That said, we have provided to date uh, the access to at least devices and hotspots. I, I've talked on multiple occasions in the past. I want to thank uh, Tony Thurman and his digital divide task force that he put together, and Linda Darling Hammond. I want to thank my wife, first partner, uh, Jennifer, uh, for her outstanding work making phone calls. Trust me, I was standing next to her in many of those cases, emails on Sunday morning, uh, trying to get philanthropy and individuals as well as companies uh, to provide devices and Wi-Fi hotspots. I think you've seen those numbers, 73 devices, 33,000 devices. We were able to procure over 100,000 free Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the state of California. We subsequently worked with California Public Utilities Commission, and they've made available an additional 87,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, part of our budget uh, effort, and they set aside uh, tens of millions of dollars in this space to help supplement the support for bridging that divide uh, for our schools. The issue, though, uh, of digital divide can't not be just distilled in uh, simple numbers of devices and Wi-Fi hotspots. We really need to provide an abundance of resource. I don't know, abundance means something to some people. Others say, well, it's a scarcity of resource. But I, I will say I'm proud this state took a lot of the CARES Act funding, a lot of the federal dollars for this pandemic. Many other states use that money for general fund purposes appropriately and understandably. We used a disproportionate amount of that federal stimulus dollars, and we gave it to our education system this year for learning loss, focused on equity, focused on the lens of addressing the lessons we learned in spring in anticipation we may need to bring those lessons and closing that divide into the fall session. $5.3 billion, real discretion, real capacity to procure more PPE, to provide more deep sanitation, to supplement supports, to individualize learning 
to the extent possible, speech therapy and other supports for uh, those with special needs, and, of course, to provide more Wi-Fi hotspots, to provide uh, more direct supports, fiber to the extent possible and preferable, to provide, obviously, more Chromebooks and the like. 100 percent of the eligible schools in California have not only been made aware of those resources, 100 percent have applied for those resources before the first deadline, and they're receiving those funds. I want to encourage you. We uh, have the ability now with our covid19.ca.gov website, encourage you to go to the covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov. Uh, go to the site, and you can learn to see exactly what your school district what their allocation was of that $5.3 billion. You can see here on this slide, $450 million went to LI Unified School District Fresno, receiving about $87 million, Elk Grove, uh, $44 million. These are just examples of uh, the money being distributed, available, ready, with flexibility, focused on the issue of learning loss. Again, equity is the word that we are focused on and fully resolved and committed to advancing. Um, when you look at the distribution of funds, if you allocate them equally, you're not allocating them equitably. And as a consequence of that, we had a, a very robust debate with the legislature on how we thought best to utilize the CARES Act's funds. Uh, Eighty-one percent of those funds we landed on that number, we wanted to prioritize for this cohort of individuals, low-income students, students with disabilities, foster youth, homeless students, and those English language learners. I'm very proud of the work we did with the legislature, uh, with the superintendent of public education, Linda Darling Hammond's outstanding work, uh, to guide us in this direction. Uh, and as has been said many times publicly, privately, uh, Brentwood is very different than Inglewood. And as a consequence, the needs are greater in Inglewood. As a consequence of that, we want to provide additional flexibility of resource to address those needs, uh, to do what we can to address these disparities and gaps that predate COVID but have now been exposed uh, at a different scale since this pandemic. And so that's the framework of focus. Equity lens, robust funding to address learning loss despite other budgetary concerns, flexibility, uh, that is needed uh, for districts recognizing localism ultimately uh, is the clarion call as it relates to education in the state. It's enshrined in the state constitution, local control over a thousand school districts in this state. So it truly is bottom up, but bottom up this year with guardrails and real money and real expectations in terms of the supports that we expect to see. Uh, with that, I want to just express my deep gratitude for the support we have received uh, as a state uh, through his leadership. Uh, it has been demonstrable uh, throughout this pandemic. Tony Thurman has been uh, not only an advocate in his role as superintendent of public instruction in the state of California, but he's an incredible partner to the state and state agencies uh, in his ability to convene people his ability to work with local districts and do the work that his task force has done, including key legislative leaders. I want to thank them as well for their support and participation. Has helped us not only procure and identify uh, the capacity uh, in terms of philanthropy uh, and more devices and Wi-Fi hotspots, but to do something else. And he can, I hope, talk to this, but he, please, Tony, talk. He's on the phone uh, about uh, more broadly, your feelings about where we are and where we're going together. But I, I did want to just acknowledge your work, uh, and I pointed this out. Tony, you may not be able to see this on the slide. Uh, the work you did with Apple, T-Mobile, Office Depot, we put out staples. They all deserve credit, Edison, uh, that have set aside hundreds of thousands of devices for California schools. It, that may not seem that interesting or even impressive, but there's a global demand for supplies for Chromebooks and for equipment for education. Uh, I don't want to say I don't want to say it's equivalent to the PPE stress that we all had early on as it relates to supplies, but supplies 
are constrained and they are not as abundant as they once were. And I just want to thank the superintendent for working with these companies to set aside and prioritize the access of quite literally hundreds of thousands of these devices for our school kids. It's a perfect example of, uh, of something that may not have gotten a lot of attention, but was a lot of work. And, uh, and he led that uh, effort uh, as well as uh, making a point that we're, uh, we followed up on. It's this last point on this bullet. And Tony, I'll turn it over to you right after this. And that is to see if we can leverage our purchasing power uh, outside of just the school districts working with CDE, California Department of Education, but how about the state coming in with all our purchasing power and doing a device state negotiated master contract so we can bring down the cost again, buy at scale, more competitive capacity to get lower costs. That's exactly what we're doing. Thank you, Tony Thurman and Mr. Superintendent, please, if you could just add your voice to all of these efforts. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Uh, thank you for your leadership. It's an honor to work with you and the legislature and the State Board of Education on doing the things that we need to do that, in my estimation, uh, amount to the most difficult circumstances that we will probably encounter in our lifetime. Um, you know, it is just that. It is a pandemic of worldwide proportion, and its impacts on California and our nation are just significant. Uh, but I am grateful that we live in a state that is led by a governor and a legislature that have made $5.3 billion available um, to support the needs of distance learning. Let's face it, 97% of our schools or so are in distance learning, at least to start, uh, as a way of being safe until we know if the conditions will change to allow what we know all of our students need in-person instruction. But until we get there, we open in distance learning, we, 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 we promote, we, we you know, approach this with safety. It is so important to have had those resources. That $5.3 billion is just incredible. Thank you, uh, Mr. Governor. Thank you to the members of the legislature. Um, uh, you know, like the governor said, we approach this in our work, but we also approach this as parents. And I want to, you know, I'm also a parent of California students. I, I just want to acknowledge first um, how difficult this is right now. And in spite of how difficult it is, everyone is leaning in. I mentioned our governor and legislative partners. I want to acknowledge um, students and parents, uh, teachers, principals and superintendents. Uh, everyone is just leaning in to figure out how to make this happen. You know, one thing that I've noted is that for every piece of guidance that any of us puts out, uh, the pandemic is constantly changing, and we've all had to be constantly changing. You know, the governor does these press conferences on a regular, is always giving new updates. We've tried to provide updates to the field on a regular basis, but our parents and students and educators are constantly adapting. You know, the beginning of school is always a time that's both exciting and filled with anxiety. I would say that that's mounted to a, a higher level now because um, we're, we're, so much has gone into preparation for months. We've all been providing guidance, but the pandemic changes, so then we have to change the guidance. So things are just moving. I just want to acknowledge that. This is a difficult environment to work in, but I want to applaud the resolve and resilience of, of everyone, students, parents, educators, administrators, all leaning in together. Uh, our county superintendents are so important to this process. They convene regular meetings of all of our 1,000 school districts. You know, it has taken just that entire partnership to, to get where we are. And where are we? Schools have opened in some districts, and many are poised to open in just a few days. Uh, in many cases, the resources are there, and in some cases, we're still scrambling to get resources together. But we're all leaning in because we recognize that we can do more together. Uh, on the issue of devices, as the governor points out, is critical. We, we prefer to be in an environment where students have computing devices and connectivity. Uh, we've worked with uh, Apple and T-Mobile um, to uh, connect them directly to districts that are still looking for devices. That for those districts, we want to remind you that you can use your learning loss mitigation funds to purchase those computing devices at a discounted rate. These devices are internet connected and they also can work across all platforms, regardless of whatever platform the district uses. Uh, as the governor has pointed out, there is a 
a, a run on supply worldwide. There just aren't enough computing devices, but Apple and T-Mobile have prioritized devices. Um, Staples and Office Depot have prioritized the devices for our schools. Uh, our team very nicely in our office has really uh, worked with our districts and our school associations to identify where the need is. A number of companies have come forward. I want to acknowledge uh, PG&E, who's uh, making a contribution to support some school districts that are in areas that have been underserved um, and need computing devices. We'll have more information to announce there. Um, we know that there's been a digital divide, but our effort is to provide technology during the pandemic and to use the digital divide task force to once and for all close the digital divide. We're focused on the short-term needs, but also keeping our eyes on the long-term needs that we know that we have communities in residential and, and rural communities that do not have access uh, to broadband. They don't have the infrastructure. And I know that there are proposals in the legislature um, to do so. As the governor says, we need federal support uh, to support building that infrastructure. Uh, we need resources for our schools. Um, and, and so that's where we all are. We're leaning in. Um, and, and I'd like to say that we should just focus on the, the three buckets that I think are probably the most important in my estimation. One is safety. Um, I appreciate that the Department of Public Health and the governor have given us a metric for when schools should be closed. Uh, that, that metric is really clear. If you're on the watch list uh, and you haven't been off for 14 days, that's a really clear metric, and I think that's important. I know there's still lots of questions about, you know, how guidance is going to work for any waivers and things of that nature, and I think we're all, as a field, trying to work through those questions. But that's a really clear metric that I like to point to. Safety has to be our first priority. I think as we think about safety, we also have to think about the social, emotional learning needs of our students. And that distance learning mitigation fund that the governor talks about allows schools to get counseling resources. We've been working with school districts to maximize Medi-Cal dollars and, and you know, I've created a counseling coalition to help address the needs of our students. That's got to be our top priority. You're going to hear us talk a lot in the days and weeks about helping districts improve their family engagement work and providing more professional development for educators on how to do distance learning at a high level. Um, the Department of Education is going to be putting out more guidance. We've worked closely with the state board, with CTA, with a number of educator groups, with school districts to get input on what that guidance might look like because we know that live instruction is important. We're not saying that kids need to be on computers all day, but we know that students do better when they see their teachers or their one-to-one -one aides uh, in, in a live, uh, you know, a, a live instruction format um, that's important to their social emotional well-being. We want that to be balanced. We, we know that educators are worried about um, the circumstances that they're headed into, and we want to be cautious. Again, safety, social emotional learning, and then we just have to continue to talk about learning. These circumstances are not ideal um, that students are returning to school in, but students continue to learn even under these conditions. And we've got to make that a priority and to make sure that we offset any learning gaps that may have resulted when we first moved into distance learning. We know that there were bumps, but I'm grateful that when we moved into distance learning, people put safety first and there was no playbook to do this. We know that times there were bumps, we're learning from that now and we're using that learning to make sure that we guide the next round of distance learning in a way that is balanced, that is thoughtful, and that offsets any learning gaps, that prioritizes equity. And you've heard the governor talk today about resources that districts can use to balance out their distance learning uh, with equity as a lens. Um, these are clearly uncharted, you know, uh, waters. These are times where we don't know all of the answers, but there are some things that we know. Um, the governor says it all the time. Wear a face covering. And that'll help to keep us safe and flatten the curve. We can't control what coronavirus does, but we can control how we respond to it. We wear a face covering, we wash our hands, we maintain physical distance, we give ourselves a fighting chance to reduce and prevent um, infection uh, across our communities and certainly in our schools. Uh, we stand committed to work closely with the governor, the Department of Public Health, the State Board of Education, the legislature on continuing to provide guidance to make sure that all of our students are served as well as they can be under these circumstances. Um, again, with a preference and focus on making sure that we do more to improve the delivery of special education, making sure we do more to support English learners, we do more to support those families who are who are loosely connected to schools. You know, we want every school to have a hotline where parents can call if they need help. Don't ask them to email. We want them to have a hotline that they can call. We'll be reaching out to school districts to talk to them about how we create these kinds of family supportive, family engagement models. These are tough times, but as it, re as it relates to providing an education to our students, we've got to rise to that challenge. We can do more together for our six million students 
I'm grateful for you, Governor. I'm grateful to our state board president and our legislature and to all of our students, parents, educators, administrators, and superintendents. Uh, continue to be safe and well, and we stay tuned and available to answer questions today and at any point for our California education system. Tremendous. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent, and thank you uh, for the spirit uh, uh, that brought you today to, to join us, but more over all the outstanding work you've done. I think what I hope uh, everybody just heard besides all the specifics and the good work the superintendent has been advancing is a spirit of collaboration, a spirit of cooperation uh, that doesn't exist in every state. Many states it does. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing uh, when you have a superintendent and governor and legislative leaders, advocacy uh, of all stripes uh, working uh, with the same goal in mind. And, and the superintendent was very honest and forthright. None of us are naive of, you know, the challenges that we experienced to, uh, in closing out uh, the school session last year, the challenges uh, that we face uh, with this ever-evolving uh, pandemic and the challenges of meeting the needs of the largest uh, school system in the United States of America. And so we're open to argument. We're interested in evidence. Uh, we're not ideological about our approach or this endeavor, uh, and we recognize the humility that needs to be uh, behind all of these efforts. Uh, some will do as designed and intended. Others will have unintended consequences that we need to own up to and address in real time. But we're condensing decades of conversations uh, in just a few months. And in that spirit and in that light, uh, I want to just pick up a little bit uh, on what uh, the superintendent just said. Uh, as it relates to the work that we need to do more broadly to support and secure technology and access and address the digital divide for the state of California uh, and for the future of our state, to support our parents, to support uh, those teachers that may not need those supports for academic purposes, but need them for economic and other purposes. Uh, one of the reasons Tom Steyer uh, agreed to co-chair our Economic and Jobs Recovery Task Force uh, was his desire and his commitment uh, to address the digital divide once and for all. Uh, he made a point which was very resonant with me, um, is we've been talking about the digital divide for the vast majority of our lifetime. Uh, I, we want to move past this uh, and have the digital divide in our rearview mirror. Uh, and while schools are foundational in those efforts, we also need to broaden uh, this uh, agenda. And so with that, I'm very pleased that uh, Tom joined us here today. Uh, he's going to update you on the work of the task force, the work that he's done with internet service providers and others. Uh, and I'll talk in a moment uh, about an executive order we're putting out today based upon his advocacy, based upon his leadership. Tom Steyer. Thank you, Mr. Governor. And I want to take a second at the outset to thank the governor and his team. They are working incredibly hard. They are making tough decisions every day to put the health of Californians first. And as the co-chair of the task force, I am very proud to play a role in helping advise them. We know that across the board, this pandemic, among its many profound impacts, has laid bare the inequalities that are baked into the foundation of our country and all of our systems. One specific example is that too many families, mainly low-income families of color, are without quality internet service. The task force, as the governor said, has been focused from its inception on collaborating to help close this digital divide. Our discussions have ranged over how it's affecting every aspect of our economic and social well-being, from telehealth to teletraining to e-commerce, but particularly the issue of distance learning, now that over 6 million California school kids will be, going, will be learning online this fall. That's why with everyone from Governor Newsom to State Superintendent Tony Thurman to the State Legislature, every member of the task force is committed to closing the digital divide in California ASAP. We want a more fair, more resilient, and more inclusive economy in the 21st century, starting with ensuring that everyone has access 
to the tools that they need to succeed. And in particular, we know that under no circumstance can we, the adults, fail our children. We cannot take no for an answer. Specifically on the task force, we've been working with members that represent Apple, Google, LinkedIn, Esri, AT&T, NBC, Universal, Comcast, Salesforce, Edison International, the Community Foundations, the California Teachers Association, and others. And they've been working diligently to bring forward specific ideas to address all aspects of the digital divide. In addition, we've been working with the other relevant private sector companies who are not members of the task force to make sure that we work collaboratively to get a comprehensive solution. In particular, the task force commends and appreciates the work of the internet service providers in our state and their longstanding efforts to provide connectivity to all Californians. But now we seek and need an even stronger partnership with them. During this time of distance learning in COVID-19, the internet service providers should and must increase their outreach regarding their affordable plan offerings help deploy near-term connectivity solutions, as well as ensure that financially insecure families remain connected. We're also looking at a number of ways to provide technical support, including leveraging the community-based programs that are already working to advance digital literacy in our communities, and finding community volunteers to provide real-time assistance to people trying to learn online. Lastly, I just want to reiterate how thankful we all are to serve a governor that listens to scientists, puts public health first, and is willing to put together a bipartisan economic task force. A governor who says, put your partisanship aside, bring me your best ideas, and let's rebuild together. At a time of great division and emotion across our country, we are doing it together. That's how we're supposed to be in America, especially when times are tough. Thank you. I appreciate the sentiment. And, and moreover, Tom, thank you for all your outstanding work uh, leading this task force. We were able just a couple of days ago to, to lay out a lot of the things that you've already accomplished on that task force and a lot of the uh, things that we'll be working with the legislature over the next few weeks to deliver. Uh, but none is more foundational the fate and future of the state of California and to future-proof this state to address the issue of, of, of equity, to address uh, this divide, again, that transcends just our school system, uh, but persists all throughout our society, uh, then finally uh, dealing with this digital divide in the state of California. No reason the state of California shouldn't lead the nation in this space. Uh, that's your resolve. It's our collective uh, commitment. And we codified a lot of that based upon guidance and support that uh, the 100 member task force provided, based upon guidance and support that a lot of key legislative leaders have provided, based upon uh, the expertise we're able to source at the California Public Utilities Commission and elsewhere. We've put out today an executive order, quite literally codifying uh, a lot of those recommendations, a lot of those thoughts. We have specific goals uh, as it relates to not just access uh, to uh, the internet, but quality access. And we're talking in terms of a goal of 100 megabytes of download speed, which should be a foundational uh, pursuit for all of us across this country. I mean, that's close to fiber-like speeds, but that's where we need to be if we're going to be globally competitive uh, and provide the quality of education, uh, regardless of our backgrounds that people deserve. We put out new mapping expectation. That was Tom's reference to Esri and others. Uh, new data collection, more transparency, more accountability. We have some strategies on funding, working with the legislature, uh, and what to Superintendent Thurman referenced some of the legislative uh, pursuits that are currently underway uh, and new expectation in terms of time uh, to delivery and deployment and adoption. We also have dusted off this old broadband council uh, that existed, uh, well, uh, 
in a world that no longer exists, or at least was conceived in a world that no longer exists, we're still in sort of the dial-up mode in some of our thinking. And so we're going we're gonna to be upgrading uh, their work and put together a new action plan uh, that has to be fundamentally reimagined moving forward. So just wanted folks to know there's progress in that space. It's in the thematic uh, that we're advancing here today as it relates to digital abide and distance learning for our kids. But it's, again, foundational for our economic future as well. Uh, speaking about our future, uh, no one more committed to the future uh, of this state than the uh, leader, uh, president uh, of our school system in the state of California, Linda Darling Hammond. Uh, many of you know her well in terms of her advocacy and support, particularly for people with special needs, uh, the work she did at Stanford University in her own right, uh, in NGO she leads uh, internationally, not just nationally, um, uh, uh, connected uh, to this cause and constantly uh, providing a leading edge thoughts and leading edge uh, advice. Uh, we are just so blessed she took this formal role here in the state of California. But in that role, um, Linda has been working with local districts on the application, not of why we need to do distance learning, not what we need to do in terms of putting those guardrails in place, but how to deliver it from a bottom up not just top-down perspective. She wants to talk a little bit more about that work. And uh, Linda, if you could just amplify the legitimate concerns we have as someone uh, with my own learning disabilities, uh, recognizing uh, the challenges with two of my kids in that place, and the really the needs to help special needs students in the state of California. I'd love you as well just to talk a little bit about that after you move forward with your broader presentation on the work you're doing at the local level. Uh, glad to do that, and thanks, uh, Governor, for all that you're doing to move this state forward in all the ways we've been talking about. I want to give us a small glimpse of what's happening in the field. How are our school systems stepping up in, in respect to all of the uh, initiatives that we've just described? I uh, checked in with school leaders in a number of large and small districts this week, and as the state superintendent said, um, educators in California really are leaning in. Uh, both on uh, the quality of distance learning and the equity concerns that we have put front and center. Uh, and we've come a long way since spring in figuring out how to do this work. Uh, when schools were physically closed in March, school districts scrambled to figure out how to purchase devices. Uh, there were supply chain problems, how to get 20% of households without Wi-Fi wired up, how to help teachers learn how to effectively teach online. Uh, since then, a lot has happened. Our 58 county offices of education have stepped up in a big way to help districts with technology and training. Four of these counties, Kern, Orange, San Bernardino, and San Diego, have launched a distance learning consortium through the CCEE, which provides curriculum units and lesson plans, as well as training for teachers. Many have created their own digital equity task forces to purchase and distribute computers. The California Department of Education and the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence have been providing guidance, toolkits, webinars, and professional learning opportunities, as we heard. Districts have spent the summer gearing up to ensure quality and equity in distance learning. Uh, in talking to school leaders this week, in districts ranging from our biggest districts in Los Angeles, San Diego, and Long Beach, to tiny, high-poverty rural districts like Elk Hills, which is 30 miles east of Bakersfield, and San Lucas, which is in a part of Monterey County that has no street lights or sidewalks. Uh, I've heard how all of those districts have ensured that 100% of their students uh, can have laptops and hotspots in settings ranging from households to homeless shelters. A huge amount of learning has really gone on. San Diego and Elk Hills held focus groups with parents to learn about what worked and what did not work last spring, what families need. That guided their plans for common online platforms and instructional approaches in the fall. Los Angeles learned more about how to offer effective online instruction by offering summer school to all. And more than 100,000 students showed up studying reading and math, of course, but also uh, music and the arts, uh, thousands of them took guitar lessons with instruments donated by Fender Guitars. They've got another 2,000 coming this year because they're committed to having the arts side by side with math and social studies and science and English language arts 
in their uh, curriculum. I heard from all of these districts how schools are organized to ensure that students will have daily face-to-face -face instruction covering the core instructional areas, uh, plus PE and the arts in large and small groups and in one-to-one -one settings where those are needed to meet special needs. Uh, and every one of these districts had really thought through how to get uh, services, wraparound services um, to students with special education needs, even online, but they're interested as soon as it's made um, viable to bring small groups back face-to-face. -face. Uh, the staff have learned how to use platforms and Zoom breakout rooms and chat boxes and how to work more effectively with parents and students in these virtual settings. In San Diego, parents and students, along with teachers, will have professional development at the start of the school year, August 31st for them. Uh, they'll all learn how to engage daily in the online learning and the project work that is going to occur in each of the subjects, as well as how to access teachers during their office hours for one-to-one -one problem solving. In Los Angeles, school starts next week. In addition to the daily classes and all their content areas, students who are in need will be able to access free online tutoring uh, to anyone who needs it. In Long Beach, starting September 1st, the district has more than enough laptops and hotspots for every child. The courses are planned and ready. And as was true last spring, they've identified excellent teachers who do a terrific job of distance learning who are offering classes in specialty subjects online. As many students as want to can come. Last spring, some of them drew over 2,000 students and some will be offering demonstration lessons online for other teachers who want to learn their approaches. In Elk Hill, school started this week. 100% of students were connected and in attendance by day two of classes. This district has um, overhauled all of its curriculum plans and the subject areas to use technology to accelerate learning. Uh, they've got social emotional learning leading off every day, and that's also common across these districts. And finally, in very rural San Lucas, every student has been provided with a new laptop and internet service. But as uh, you and Tom Steyer and others were describing, Wi-Fi is still sometimes unreliable. So the district has prepared a plan B and a plan C. If the Wi-Fi fails, the students can call in to join the class and talk to the teacher. Students also have paper packups for backup if they can't get through um, online. Every week, the staff will convene to figure out how to reach any children who are not able to engage that week, including making socially distanced house calls. They've got a mobile science lab that will provide free brown bag science projects. Every week, they'll offer reasons to come to school, ranging from Music Mondays with dance videos to Travel Tuesdays with virtual field trips and Wacky Wednesdays with silly dress options and crazy hair days for online meetings with prizes from local organizations. So everyone is leaning in. The creativity that uh, our educators are showing in addressing this moment and in keeping equity front and center in this work is encouraging. We'll certainly encounter more challenges, but California is learning how to do this work. And at the end of the process, if we continue to double down, uh, when we go back to school in person, we're likely to have an uh, entire school system, students and staff that are more technologically proficient, stronger connections between home and school because people have had to figure out how to do that, and more capacity to support learning progress than we had before. I'm glad to answer additional questions, particularly on the issue of meeting the needs of our English learners and special education students. Um, I can say that in every uh, case where I talked to uh, school leaders, uh, this was front of mind for them and uh, very creative approaches to try to figure out how to use small Zoom breakout rooms for paraprofessionals to work with the students with special needs, one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with specialists as well as with classroom teachers um, and uh, eagerness to get back to school in person. And Linda, perhaps just uh, if I may, just because I think it's important, the guidelines we put out recently afford the ability for districts to make a determination for those with acute needs uh, to allow in-person 
instruction, even uh, with the broader guidelines we put out. Maybe you can uh, just amplify that. I know there's additional uh, work being done in that space, but as a foundational principle, that is one that we have advanced uh, through your leadership, Tony Thurman's leadership. Yeah, and we, um, many, many districts are prepared to offer small, um, small group settings, even while schools are closed in the way that childcare uh, settings are allowed to operate with all of the rules that, you know, you reviewed for us earlier, um, to be able to bring back in person uh, those students whose needs um, are difficult to meet online and are much better met in person. We are working through guidance with the uh, California Department of Public Health that should be released this coming week that will um, allow school districts in collaboration and consultation with their local public health department um, to um, convene these small groups of students uh, in safe ways uh, that allow their needs to be met in person. I appreciate that. More on that uh, subject, but uh, I appreciate you just setting forth uh, the broader uh, tenure of expectation in terms of uh, our recognition that there are simply kids that will never ever have that quality learning that we all desire to advance uh, online, no matter what kind of support we provide, even if we individualize it. And so we'll acquire even more. And so thank you for all of your work in that space and, and including just your incredible advocacy. It's a space I don't want to get off topic, but over the last year and a half, uh, the budgets uh, that we have preserved even in this economy and the budgets we substantially enhanced last year were in the special education space. And we recognize we have enormous amount of work still left to do. Again, as I said, closing things out, bottom line, learning is non-negotiable, but neither is safety. With that, let me briefly go through uh, the issue uh, that brings many of you to these press conferences and quickly update you on the latest number of case case positive cases that we have brought in since August 13th. Uh, you'll see a number there of 7,934, uh, as was the case on Wednesday. Before you jot that number down, uh, consider uh, that this will be the last day uh, we will have to report uh, backlogged cases related to a backlog uh, that many of you are very familiar with. Of the 7,934, 4,429 are backlog cases, putting our new case number today at 3,505. So this was uh, the day we committed to reporting out our efforts to clean up that backlog, bring all the positive cases related to the backlog of total cases, roughly 295,000 cases. Uh, a lot of those will be deduplicated, uh, and roughly uh, 20,000 positives in that cohort. On Monday, we're going to break down by county a detailed list so people will have with clarity and precision uh, every single number, again, on the county by county basis. But this completes our efforts, 100% uh, uh, of our efforts to address the backlog, to update our case numbers. And that's exactly what we're doing here on this slide and on this slide. Our positivity rate now in the state of California averaging 137,000 tests a day, and I'll repeat that, we're averaging 137,000 tests a day, 188,000 a few days back, 111,000 that came in yesterday. Averaging 137,000 uh, cases, we have a positivity rate, percentage of people that test positive for COVID-19 versus the total number of people that were tested of 6.2% uh, over uh, the last a 14-day period. Last time I presented the positivity rate, it was at 7.0% today uh, at 6.2%, moving as we uh, asserted a few weeks back and certainly asserted last week in a positive direction. You could see here and you unpack this, the 14-day look at the positivity rate, uh, see where it was even pre uh, the last presentation at 7.0, uh, over 7.3, dropping down, stabilizing, bouncing around a little bit in the last seven or so days. Not surprisingly, and in accordance with trends that we have presented consistently over the course of months, positivity rates, uh, hospitalizations, ICUs, uh, being uh, having a relational 
uh, construct here, hospitalization numbers continue to decline, decline 14 day number, 19.9% decrease, 20% decrease over a 14 day period. That's an encouraging sign. I remind you, as I always do, this is the total number in the aggregate. None of us live in the aggregate. Each and every one of you lives somewhere uh, to the extent you're watching this within the state of California, somewhere in the state, hospitalization numbers may vary, may be very different in terms of outlook and concerns for you. That's why we have a county monitoring list uh, reminding you the state's population is larger than 21 state populations combined. But in the aggregate, the state of California has experienced a roughly 20 percent decrease in hospitalization patients that have identified COVID-19 in the last 14 days. Uh, the last slide presentation. Um, last Monday, you saw numbers as high as 9 percent total uh, capacity in the hospital system, uh, bed capacity filled with COVID-19 patients. We're now uh, at 7 percent. ICU admissions down uh, some 14.3 percent, uh, roughly 14 percent, uh, basically tracking where hospitalizations are. Uh, and that's an encouraging sign. Uh, we need to see more stability. We need to see that line continue to bend in this direction. We're not out of the woods. Do not take that snapshot, by the way, of 33 or so hundred positive cases uh, to assume anything. The trend over a 14 day period shows a much higher number than that. But we are seeing a trend nonetheless that is moving in the right direction because of all of your outstanding work. Thank you to everybody watching. Thank you to 40 million Californians um, and those that have really done their best to be responsible not only to their own health, but to their friends, family, loved ones in the broader community and the society. We're trying to rebuild after this pandemic. Care capacity in the ICUs down to about 20 percent uh, from 22, 23. Um, and so you see that reflected in the pie chart. Uh, again, uh, encouraging numbers, putting a little less pressure on the system. But again, that pressure persists in certain parts, certain regions of the state disproportionately now, as we've been very clear about in the Central Valley, uh, eight counties that uh, continue in that valley to be top of mind of concern and consideration. But even in the Central Valley, uh, we're seeing uh, in most cases, not every case, most case, a rate of growth that's beginning to decline, but still growth that is of concern. As the superintendent said, I don't have to always say it, please wear a mask, continue to physically distance. These are rules and guidelines that we put out within our education system when, not if, we reopen for in-person learning. That will happen, if you ask when that will happen, sooner than later if we continue to wear a mask and continue to take seriously the need to physically distance, including this weekend, where we now have a new flex order that just came out from Cal ICE ISO, uh, independent system operator. Uh, that basically means those are the experts as it relates to energy consumption in the state. Uh, they wanted me to tell you uh, that this flex warning that they put out today uh, means it would be uh, helpful to the entire electrical delivery system in the state of California. If you can, to the extent warranted and possible, reduce your electricity consumption between the hours of 3 and 8 p.m. We're seeing tri triple digit uh, temperatures. I think I read they're anticipating Death Valley temperatures to go to a record of 127 degrees. That's in our state. That's not some distant land overseas. Uh, the next seven, eight, nine, ten days, uh, we're going to experience uh, record-breaking temperatures, as the case in any jurisdiction on the globe. That means we can all do well just to be thoughtful about our electricity and energy consumption. So um, if you wanted to remind your kids when you walk out of a room to turn the lights off, this is the time to do it, particularly between the hours of 3 and 8. When you're out there this weekend, because of those triple-digit temperatures, we encourage you to uh, physically distance, avoid as much mixing as you possibly can, maintain your vigilance as it relates to your own personal hygiene, uh, and washing your hands, being 
uh, the most impactful thing you can do. So that's uh, a very long-winded presentation, forgive me, but I don't know anything more important to parents out there in the state of California than the subject matter uh, that uh, brings us uh, to this hour. And I also want to just again thank uh, the uh, head of our State Board of Education, uh, Linda Darling Hammond, and thank the Superintendent of Public Education, Tony Thurman. Thank you to the co-chair uh, of our Economic Recovery Task Force, Tom Steyer, for their participation, their presentations here today. And all of them stand by with me if, to answer any questions. Hannah Wiley, SAC B.